Hello everyone, my name is Kyle Blaha. I'm the Artistic Director of New York Youth Symphony Composition and welcome to the New York Youth Symphony Artist Story Series. Our special guest today is the amazing composer and advocate Molly Joyce. Hi Molly. Hi. <laughs> A huge part of this interview is going to deal with accessibility and representation of disabilities in the arts. So before we even jump into the interview, um, Molly, could you talk about what an accessible interview looks like, some of the aspects of it? Um, sure. So I think a first step is providing a visual description of the um, participants in the interview, especially helpful for um, blind and low vision users. Mm -hmm. um, so to start for myself, um, I'm a white, light-skinned female. Um, with blue eyes and brown hair. Um, today my hair is tied up in a ponytail and I'm kind of in this long room um, with a lot of art behind me, a fridge to the left or right of me. I get confused, but um, and yeah, that's where I am today. Um, I'm a light-skinned male. I have short brownish blonde hair. My eyes are green, blue, or gray, depending on the day. I'm wearing a black polo and I'm in my dining room, uh, which has gray paint and some glasses on a shelf and a plant behind me. <laughs> All right, so we have the description. What else would be an aspect uh, of an accessible interview? Uh, sure, so including um, closed or open captions um, mm -hmm. of the kind of spoken or even oral content in general, um, which is especially helpful for deaf and hard of hearing audiences, mm -hmm. um, and also sign language interpretation. Um, that's really- Which we're including with this interview. Yes, which will be included and which is really kind of a different um, as another layer of accessibility for all audiences. Wonderful. Thank you. So I knew you as a student at Juilliard and we're years past this and you've really solidified a really beautiful place for yourself as a composer and advocate in the art music world. And I was wondering if you would talk about your journey getting here and all the musical and sort of life steps that led you here. Um, sure, I think where to start, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> exactly. um, so I think I was, uh, again, I feel like I was always so grateful to you. I think I even met you before Juilliard in Paris yes, with the at Paris, European yes. American, yeah, Musical Alliance program. Yeah. And I feel like I was always so grateful for you because I think I was freaking out over placement exams, I think for your training and you really helped <laughs> calm me down and kind of get me prepared for that. Um, I was of course really so fortunate to go to Juilliard for my undergraduate studies, I mm. think also being in New York, it felt like a, another college education onto itself, going to concerts yeah. there, and was really grateful to um, do a lot of internships during my time there, um, such as at like Le Poussin Rouge and Boozy and Hawks, and also New Amsterdam Records, who I'm still involved with today. Um, and also during my time there, I was really grateful to, of course, I'm always grateful for their amazing <clears throat> counterpoint and ear training, all that like kind of very, but, like kind of objective, almost craft musical training, which I feel like still informs my work today. Um, but also really interfacing with the dancers and actors there, um, especially mm -hmm. more involved with dance today. I was even roommates with a dancer one year there. And um, I think just really thinking beyond your discipline, but you're all in this one building in a way. Um, it's like so, um, just so influential, especially at a younger age, I think, and really seeing how different um, artists in a way pr approach their art forms. Um, so I was really fortunate for that. And then following Juilliard, I um, went to the Netherlands in The Hague to study for one year mm. um, with the composers Martijn Padding and Hus Janssen. And that was you know, incredible in and of itself. Um, just, I think, one, like being in an international um, setting or kind of out of your comfort zone. Um, every day you're going to be challenged, even from the grocery store to studying and yes. trying to travel around as much as possible. Um, and, and yeah, and I think just the way I feel like they have a little more I feel like patience for new music there or something like that, or just the way they approach new works in general um, was incredibly invigorating. Um, and then, yeah, and then following that, I was grateful to go come back to the U.S. for graduate studies at Yale, where I got my master of music. Um, again, incredibly um, incredible experience and really grateful for. I think I tried to take as kind of the opposite of Juilliard in a way that since it was a university, I tried to take as many non-music classes mm -hmm. as possible. And I had a lot of um, like collaborations with the art school, which I really loved and going to their crits, what they call it, or critiques. Um, I even like performed in my friend's like painting final review, <laughs> like he did That's a amazing. monologue, which I just loved how the, especially the visual, visual artists just kind of transverse medium, which I felt like I could never like show a painting at my concert mm -hmm. or something. It always felt like so, so specific in medium with composition. 
Um, and I also even took like a leadership class with the former general Stanley McChrystal, which I was always amazed I even got into, which is all these kind of extra disciplinary experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and also during the, the end of my time at Yale, I did an independent study in disability studies, um, which really um, was just incredibly kind of eye-opening and enlightening in the best way possible. Um, I have an impaired left hand from a car accident about 20 years ago. and. Um, it's just been a journey, I think, from denying the disability to really recognizing it first and foremost and um, coming upon that disability studies literature, especially reading about disability as some social construction along the same lines of race and gender was just like kind of just open the door, if you will. Like, I feel like I was always heading that direction. And, um, and yeah, it just kind of set me on this path today. And you actually have a diploma in disability studies, right? Yeah, and I was going to say more recently, I have an um, advanced, what they call it, advanced certificate from mm -hmm. uh, CUNY, like School of Professional Studies. And um, and then this next year, I'm starting a doctorate in virtuosity and disability. Oh, that's um, amazing. Cool. Yeah, so I'm really excited. <laughs> but I, but um, so, so no, much. So is, yeah, is, you have these two worlds. You have your musical side and you have, mm -hmm. you know, your side with your impaired left hand. And it's just seeing how you sort of combine these worlds into something beautiful and unique into like your everyday career in life. Um, it's just been very amazing. And I was hoping you would maybe talk a little bit further of how you've taken this and sort of made accessibility um, as an aesthetic choice and a part of your creation. Sure. I think so. As I started learning more about disability studies and the arts, especially near the end of my graduate studies in Yale, at Yale about four years ago, um, of course, I started coming more upon accessibility um, as like kind of a crucial aesthetic, I would say underpinning for disabled artists and um, works really grounded in disability. And um, by accessibility, I mean, I mean, I think many people interpret it in many different ways, but mm -hmm. kind of having multiple sensory outputs of the work, at least for myself. Yeah. Um, so coming from more oral output with my music, um, also having that visual output with kind of videos I play with and open captions of lyrics I'm singing having those senses. And I think also in my ideal context, I'd have like tactile facets or haptic um, to feel mm. vibrations of the music and help mm. um, guide um, blind and low vision users. And um, there's even things like in museums, making sure there's benches for people to sit down mm. or rest areas, um, um, things that aren't as, um, you know, sensory provoking almost in a way. And again, it could go on and on and I'm happy to recommend some resources. And I also just add to it, feel that accessibility, at least for me, there's always more to learn and improve upon. Mm -hmm. um, it'll never be kind of mastered in the best way possible. And I feel that I never really want to master my art in a way. I feel like there's always more to learn, especially with input from direct users. Um, but anyway, that's kind of my <laughs> intro primer on accessibility. But mm -hmm. so I think the more I learned about it, and I think it's interesting is when you start, when you see videos with say, like with open captions or sign language interpretation, I think we're so, even myself, like this, um, I think we're so conditioned in this kind of ableist world, if you will, to view it as a tack on or accommodation or not aesthetically pleasing, you know, like you'd ideally want the video without the captions or something. And um, for me, it's been a process of trying to incorporate it in my work for more and more, more and more. And also in this kind of integral way that you can't imagine the work without those um, accessibility facets and really prioritizing it from the start. You bring up really interesting points. You know, I think in, in the classical music industry, it's also very current to be like, how can we reach more people? How can we let more people yeah. into what we're doing and have it less uh, less sort of exclusive and you know mm -hmm. only for fancy people? You know, yeah. you know, but, you know, and, and to actually invite the world in so that we yeah. can survive and and, yeah. and make it effective and purposeful um, yeah. in the world. You know, no, definitely, and I feel that. I mean, I'm still again always learning about this. I think and hopefully mm -hmm. improving, but like music is not only for hearing people, <laughs> you know, you can feel it through vibrations mm -hmm. or having visual output of it. Um, but I think um, deaf and hard of hearing audiences are not gonna come to events if it's not accessible. Like if you can't, yeah. um, you know, gain um, access to that information being transferred, like why would you attend that <laughs> or something? And um, I feel like sometimes it drives me crazy, like simple things as captions, like could be easily added, especially in the day of AI or all this technology, mm -hmm. which I know is not always perfect, but, um, so there's just, yeah, I think a lot to improve in that area. And when we were speaking last week, um, you had mentioned that you actually, <clears throat> was it in Washington, D.C., that you were um, doing uh, some research? 
Yeah, I think with accessibility mm -hmm, or with, mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, yeah, with like a project, I think with mm -hmm. more communal <laughs> engaged projects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, which I'm happy to share. I was gonna say I could also share an example of the dance video. Oh, maybe, please, please. yes, absolutely. Like, um, yeah, let me just, I'm double checking. <laughs> um, so this video includes more kind of open captions of the lyrics I'm singing and kind of mm -hmm. um, incorporate and, and um, incorporation of the sign language interpreter. Love um, so I'll share it first. I'll describe a little more after. Thank you. No, and that was an excerpt from a larger work titled Left and Right um, in collaboration with the dancer Jaron Herman, um, the um, sign language interpreter Brandon Kazen Maddox, um, director Austin Reagan, and writer and audio describer Max Grayson and myself. So, okay. yeah. um, so, so do you want to continue about that or? Uh, sure, I think just to point out, I guess like in that video, um, or I think just the genesis of the work, uh, Jaron and I have a kind of interesting body setup and in that we both have um, impaired left sides yet through different sources. So drawn through congenital disability and myself acquired disability. Um, and with that work, we're just kind of exploring the myth of the left side is typically kind of dirty mm. and kind of, um, sinister almost. I think left and Latin even translates to sinister. And, um, and with that, we were really trying to prioritize access as well. So we engaged um, Max Grayson, who's this amazing audio describer and writer and um, audio description usually provides um, simply an audio description for blind and low vision users, especially with like movements, such as dance mm -hmm. or, or um, so we're trying to incorporate it first, um, kind of more artistically. Um, so there are three sections of the works and of the work and in some of the sections are we kind of traded the primacy of each discipline. So in one of the sections, the description came first and the dance and the music and one section, the dance first and the music and the description and so on. Um, but really trying to usually, usually I'd say audio description comes a little later in the process, like once the mm -hmm. dance is done or the work is done, but really trying to insert it kind of first and foremost, um, just one of the ways kind of experimenting with prioritizing access. Your work also brings up an, a very sort of meaningful idea of representation of disabilities within the arts. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't see a lot of representation of disabilities mm -hmm. in our world. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that, ways we could fix this, just like general ideas, um, how you've sort of, I, I mean, you just showed this project, which is a beautiful representation, but maybe other things you've explored or done to, to sort of remedy this. Sure. It's something I, I think, yeah, it's a question I feel like I want like a year to think about or something. Mm -hmm. Or a lifetime. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I think there's a lot of great, you know, organizations and artists doing great work out there, especially with disability arts. And um, that's what I feel too, that there's so many great artists out there. I think they're just um, not getting really the recognition they deserve. Or I think if an organization really isn't looking for it, it's easy to um, look past it. And I would say some things with like simple things like organizations providing like an access statement on the website or something like that, even especially for disabled audiences, um, but really trying to engage disabled communities, I would say directly, I think is most imp really important. And there's plenty mm -hmm. of um, advocacy and I think local disability centers and so on um, that I think, um, yeah, will hopefully provide a more direct connection. Um, 
again, I feel like I really need to think about this. For, oh, yeah. It, it's just, you know, to sort of bring awareness. I mean, you know, and so that everyone's thinking about it, or at least more people, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think just sort of bringing it up and talking about it is, is the first step for a lot of people. Um, yeah, I think, and even talking about like the word, like I feel like a lot of people don't even want to say the word disability or they're afraid mm -hmm. that they're saying the wrong word, um, which I think is a really important conversation to have. Um, a lot of disabled activists, I feel like I see a lot of articles that, you know, to say, to say that word, dis disability, or um, one time the, uh, the legendary activist Judith Human or Judy Human told me to keep saying that or put it in my bio more, like I think the more people say it, the more it'll I don't think normalize disability, but just um, allow it to be really a legitimate minority and identity mm. as it is. Um, I think that's a really important conversation to have too, because I feel like so many times disabled artists are put in these situations where then they have to like explain disability or they can't even talk about the word. I don't know, all these kind of conflicting um, forces kind of. Yeah, well, and I think also <laughs> in our current state, people are very careful about terminology and, yeah, and, and, they're, and we're very sensitive yeah to the terms we use and make sure that people were representing them with the correct terminology as a sign of like acknowledgement and respect so yeah. the more you use the term disabled then everyone can feel comfortable sort of saying like yes this exists you know yeah, exactly. we we acknowledge it and we're we're going to work on access um and yeah, representation definitely. yes definitely <laughs> so you and your projects actively engage people with disabilities and i was wondering uh, sort of your process with this, like your your creative process, your um, sort of uh, adv advocacy process of of getting these projects going, and where your creative brain is. Sure, I would say with uh, obviously, of course, really varies on the project and mm -hmm. the one that I shared with kind of the sign language interpreter and captions and so on. Um, I, you know, I, this was like kind of an access learning moment for me, you know, I thought by engaging the descri audio describer and sign language interpreter, I kind of had access covered, but then I realized I needed to hire um, a deaf or hard of hearing person along with a blind and low vision user to kind of test those measures, if that makes sense, mm. to provide feedback, um, which I did for that project, which I was so happy. It was such a, such a, the thing I love about accessibility is such a natural way to engage other people in the project or collaborate with them. Um, so that's been kind of a learning point and a good way for me to get feedback on that, which I consistently do from now on. Mm -hmm. um, and also in a more recent project, I've, um, I guess the project's about two years old now, it's called Perspective, and I um, interview um, disabled people and I try to get across the range of disabilities and experiences on um, questions and concepts that I feel are really central to the disabled experience, um, such as like what is access for you, what is care for you, um, what is interdependence for you and more. Um, and then I kind of usually edit down their interviews and add my musical underscoring um, and create kind of open caption videos for them. Oh, beautiful. Um, do, you have, do you have an I, excerpt of that? Yeah. <laughs> I need to check it out. Um, so I'll share, this is a week, um, an excerpt. This is an excerpt from the interdependence um, section. I just want to make sure I share it on you. <laughs> Trust and also care and knowing one's strength and weakness and embracing those things. About rejecting that mastery model that would suggest I know it all, I can do it all, I will impose it all on everyone else and it is humbly recognizing that actually all of our lives are facilitated by multiple others usually unseen other wherever any of us got it, it required so many others uh, to support us and we should value that just that is some sort of weakness. Collaborate. Access and inclusion and lack of access and exclusion are interdependent on each other. Everything. <laughs> Realizing that we all have our care networks and 
we all need them. Um, yeah, no, it's an excerpt from the interdependence section. <laughs> and you had also mentioned your interviews, you, you have a series that you do interviewing people with disabilities. Where could our audience members access that? Um, sure. So it's under on my website, like mollyjoyce.com. And then there's a, I think it's under works and then projects and then perspective. Or, but I think it's mm -hmm. mollyjoyce.com slash project slash perspective. And we've we've talked a lot about your past, and I wonder what's next for you. What projects are you working on that we can look forward to? Um, sure. So with this interview project now, I'm actually um, pursuing two new iterations. Um, one in Idaho, Boise, Idaho, where I am now, where I interviewed um, members of a um, kind of non-disabled and disabled dance company, and I interviewed the disabled members. And so I'm editing down that audio and adding adding my music now, and they'll dance to it in a couple of weeks. And then I'm also pursuing iteration um, in Minnesota with the Great Northern Festival, which will be up in an in-person installation in the winter, which I'm really excited about. Because it's been, of course, with COVID in a way, it's been a kind of journey to get this in person. Um, and then, and then um, I guess with my, accompanying my doctorate, I'm doing like virtuosity and disability studies. So I'll be producing a new um, work series in a few years, focusing on like virtuosity from disability and. That'll involve um, many aspects, but one is including my surgical records and looking into that and getting language from that. And um, yeah, so it's very exciting. <laughs> uh, and you're also a faculty member, correct? Uh, yes, at NYU and uh, Wagner College. Yes, that's a big deal. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I think we're about at time. Um, maybe to close, if people are interested in sort of taking this further, not only uh, in regard to disabilities in the arts, but just access and representation, where can we go from here? Yeah, I think where to start, but I think um, one of my favorite websites is Disability Arts Online. It's like a UK publication. Um, there's so much happening in the UK in general with disability arts and just a great resource for like podcasts, opinion articles, reviews, and more kind of what's happening, I guess, in the more UK European scene. Um, and also in the US, I'd say the Kennedy Center's VSA program, they're doing a lot of great work. Um, mm -hmm. Also the Ford Foundation recently announced um, some Disability Futures Fellows, that was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so even looking at those fellows and their, their work is a great place to start. Um, and also if you have Netflix, uh, the film Crip Camp is a really great, I think, primer to the disability rights movement and the history behind oh, could it. Could you repeat that? Uh, yeah, on Netflix, it's Crip mm -hmm. Camp. Uh, it's okay. a documentary. It was uh, nominated for an Oscar this past year too, and Wonderful. it was a really great, yeah, intro to the disability rights movement. Well, thank you so mo much, Molly. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, okay. uh, we thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great one. <laughs>